This Moonless Sky, Part 3. I'm just going to jump right in here. So to get the context, you'll have to listen to the previous two parts. This is Marik, the narrator, talking. So yes, let's get back to Earth here. I mean to Voyaler. The metallics, the ceremony of greeting. So here came this kid of circa fourteen, looking very intelligent and eager to see the new world, down out of, well, my spaceship. Where had they been hiding him? Had he been in the ice box all along? Could they only revive one at a time? They revived me not long after they got to the inner solar system and thought out enough oxygen to give me my old bedroom back. I guess I was up there for three months or so, acclimatizing to being alive again before they put me down here on Voyaler. The guys were great to me, but I could have used a human friend up there. It got pretty boring. I can see, though, that having two of us would have doubled the oxygen demand, not to mention the demand for food, water, and other precious commodities. Clearly, touching down on this planet and delivering me would have given the crew the chance to take on more supplies, and maybe those supplies were needed to revive a second human. It's strange that no one said anything to me, though. Also, I'm sure they told me that other ships had set down multiple humans, all in living condition. Ours wasn't an unusually small ship. I had asked lots of questions about that sort of thing, just out of general curiosity. Who knows, then, why they had decided to pop out another boy, unannounced, at this late date. They could be mysterious entities at times. Restocking of supplies was clearly one of the plans for this trip. I could see the cargo bays of the lander opening up already. Meanwhile, though, Nashi waved me closer to where he, the boy, and Dea were congregated at the base of the landing platform. A few people took photos of us, and one sketched with a pencil. I looked across the packed sand of the after dunes, enjoying the Vierlian sun blazing across my shoulders and glinting off the whitish tree branches in the distance. A little cloud of red parrots in and around one of the trees gave occasional bursts of color and chatter. Mark, my beamish boy, Nashi said, sounding just like my dad. While I was out of it and being prepared for cold storage, he'd gone through a lot of my memories while making a backup copy of them. Ever since then, he'd used all these expressions that my dad used to use. My dad had a degree in English literature. Could you please take this young fellow, who I know you'll think of as Yithy, under your wing? He knows all about you, and he's looking forward to being on this planet with you. He's relatively young. He doesn't have as much experience at being human as you have. So if you could look out for him, I would appreciate it. Yes, sir, I said. I'd love that. Hi, Yith. I don't think we need the Y at the end of your name. Hi, he chirped. Fahalust. Oh, a clever one. He'd learned the communicator for a personal hello. Fahalust. It's okay. You can call me whatever, he said. He gave me an unexpectedly warm smile. I unexpectedly skipped a heartbeat, and then bravely returned the same smile. So, how long have you been, um... Up and around, alive and breathing. Lately, I mean. Since they thawed you out, I meant. About a hundred petatics, he said. The ship had a cesium atomic clock that the metallics used to time everything. A hundred quadrillion ticks was about four months of Earth time. Reckon nine billion hundred ninety two million six hundred and thirty one thousand seven hundred and seventy ticks per second. And yes, I did look that up. Wish you'd been around when I was up there, I said, angling for some explanation. Oh, yeah, definitely, me too, he said, and gave me that smile again. I'm sorry I couldn't introduce you too earlier, now, she said. To tell you the truth, Yeth was more of a scientific challenge for us than you were, Mark. We consider ourselves to have done very well to bring him around in, even in this short a time. We had a chance to tinker with you back in your solar system, but with him we needed a fresh start. Human biology has a lot of heavy wiring in it. Yeah, okay, no need to apologize. I know you guys always do everything you can for me, when you have the chance. Kankasht, he said, in his own language. It's rather like thank you, but it means lift it up that we are powers together. Sort of an uplifting salute to cooperation. Kankasht, I said, giving the customary reply. Lift it up that we proceed well together. This may sound terribly over the top until you remember that 
goodbye actually means God be with you, as a communicator friend once explained to me in a shipboard conversation. Any other official business? Dea asked Nashi. No, we have a list of things we hope you might find for us, but we gave you all of our mail from home last time around. Our total trade for you this time is this one interesting young human. We think you'll like him. As for me, I might as well get our cultural and bio databases caught up while we're here. Sutarakristach, not a madnachna here, will give me a hand, or a chip, I should say. A nearby metallic, my old friend Sutti, waved a couple of extensible body parts in acknowledgement. I gave him a friendly wave. The quote-unquote mail from home, Nashi referred to, was information from Earth. The communicators mostly traded information from back on Earth for the supplies and data they wanted to take on board. They also brought new plants and animals, and sometimes even microorganisms they thought we'd need, plus specimens of technology. Mainly we got vast amounts of knowledge from them. They long ago helped us to set up computers and store and handle the info. That was well before any talk of computers had shown up in the stream of information coming from the Earth. We had to get our information from the Earth the slow way. We didn't get any direct electromagnetic signals from our old home planet, even though radio waves could have reached us in 40 years or so. Maybe our sun or something else interfered with them, or maybe our detectors were inadequate, or maybe the Earth had stopped broadcasting, switched to a more efficient and private form of communication, perhaps. The communicator ships were not sophisticated craft that attained near-light speeds. They just plotted through space, much like our Earth rockets would have, if they'd been moderately improved. Whatever they brought us was literally hundreds of thousands of years out of date, in comparison with any radio waves that could have reached us from the Earth at light speed. In effect, I'd been on an interstellar camel caravan. Voyaller was one of its oases that it stopped at. Okay, said Dea, let's wrap it. We can all do what we need to do in the next while, and then the Bri starts at 7 p.m. My house is putting on the party. Bri was an Earth term for barbecue that I wasn't familiar with until I came here. It's a word from South Africa. I know pick an old Bri, 7 p.m., said two state assistants, speaking through small megaphones. There was a round of applause. Horses whinnied in the distance, knowing the applause was probably their cue to get some action again. Traffic into the National Park was almost entirely on foot, either your own or your animals. Spacecraft accepted. Dea turned to me after glancing at Nashi and said, Why don't you take Euthythith on a little tour, and we'll talk when you get back. I decided to take his advice. Then went to Piyotakr. Goodbye for now, I said to Nashi, and waved at the rest of the gang. Yith gave them a silent upraised salute, the hands over your head like a diver thing. And he looked at me expectantly. By the way, the in that first word is a little click that humans can make by sucking one side of their tongue back from their inner gums. It's the chuck sound English people make twice to urge their horses on. The communicators always like to mention Klozo from South Africa as a popular earth language that has the same sound in it, their letter X to be exact. So if you're human, you can say that alien word with a little work. Goodbye. Believe me, if I can do it, anyone can. Let's head over this way, I said to Yith. I waved at my buddy Xus, who was in the crowd, conspicuously waiting for a signal from me. A few of our school friends were nearby. I think we'll start off by going to the beach. Do you know how to swim? I have an idea how it's done, but I've never tried, said Yith, shaking his bangs out of his eyes with a flick of his head. Sounds cool. Huh? Never swum? Where was this kid from? A trailer park in Death Valley? I didn't want to start grilling him with questions right away, though. Most of the crowd was also on the way to the beach, and the three of us assembled with a couple more friends and plodded along with them. Hey, said Khosaran, giving us his usual laconic greeting. It was a verbal shrug that concealed infinite loyalty. Yithithith, this is Khosaran, my other brother, I said to Yith. But as soon as I uttered this common local expression, I realized he might not recognize it. He spoke English with an accent that sounded somewhere between Los Angeles and Vancouver. Uh, my best friend, in other words, is what I mean. 
Our planet still cultivated English and some other Earth languages for literary, academic, and historical reasons, and I was in great demand as an English speaker. But my English had become infected by some local phrasing, mostly direct translations of idioms in our regional language, Sdianans. The other main language of our country, Sklarabats, was unrelated to Sdianans. Our people were mostly, mostly transplanted from Europe and Asia, and theirs came from a farming area that was slowly overtaken by expansion of the Sahara Desert in Africa. The communicators had rescued and transported a single large shipload of them, who otherwise would have died of starvation during a catastrophic drought. Our side had come in on various ships over the millennia. So, Kit, Penan Atieren et Vuelersu, welcome to our world, said Xus, surprisingly formally. Thanks, said the towhead, who was looking a little shy and out of place. Where are you from originally? I asked. Dunno, he said, shrugging. I don't really have any memories before being woken up on the ship. I think the Josephs Ashish had their work cut out, you know, medically. You poor kid, I said. I wonder what grotesque thing happened to you. I didn't get that wrecked up myself, and I jumped off a bridge. Oh my gosh, that's sad. Wow, how excellent that you survived. Sometimes I wonder if I did, or if this is some version of the next life. But whatever it is, I'm grateful for it. So... The guys didn't tell you where they picked you up? No. They knew I had no memory. They said I could get a fresh start. No need to carry over disasters, accidents, tragedies. So said Tumarahash Napkarnak Shlomotk. I gave him a penetrating look, but I decided it was rude to ask what was on my mind. I was wondering why he used these elaborate communicator terms and phrases so much. I had painfully memorized a few greetings but I couldn't wrap my tongue around most of the language. I knew that the two-word version of a communicator's four-word name was almost like a nickname, and it was used in a friendly way like a like a Russian patronymic. You know, where Nikolai Nikolaevich Ustinov will be called Nikolai Nikolaevich by his workmates when they're being respectful. We studied that in our Diversity of Earth Cultures class in school. But I certainly never developed this habit with my metallic friends. It was too difficult and I found the communicator's own name for their tribe, Schosisisa, whatever. Uh, I know I could copy in the proper text here, but this is how my mind sounds to me as I write. Uh, much too challenging to say out loud. As you, see, as you can see, I practice it for this reading. Anyways, it just meant communicator. Finally, I said, you have quite the skill with languages. Maybe yes, maybe no, he said. I think they might have given my brain a little help. Ah, oh, maybe an implant of some kind. They were wizards with marrying technology to tissue, as they like to put it. Now that has to be mighty strange, being a tabula rasa, a blank page, apart from a huge pile of facts, and maybe a personality, no memories. Huh. He seemed nice enough, though I can't imagine what a personality would be like without any memories at all. <laughs>